Early this morning, July 17th, 2023, I woke up very early, it was probably 5 or 5.30 and in the morning, and I had an email from a friend. He's an older gentleman, and he did a documentary about his ancestor that was the one who carved the Lincoln statue that's in the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. And this was back in the 1800s, and she was a very young woman, like about 18, and she was chosen by Lincoln himself to carve his statue. She carved a lot of the generals, like General Lee of the Civil War, and various figures within the Civil War. She was an excellent artist. So, he is descended from her, and he also records symphony. So, you know, I was in symphony, so we became friends. And because I had a book that was a huge masterpiece, and he had a book about his ancestor, the artist, and I met him at a production club. Um, it was actually over at the senior center where the seniors are, um, the older seniors, and that was kind of around the time that I was packing to leave home, and so I only was able to go to a few of the meetings, but we became friends, and um, so he sends me emails periodically. And his career for his life, and he's retired now, and um, an older gentleman, and he sent me an email about Egyptian stuff, and he was talking about watching the Cleopatra movie from 1963. And because his career was as a machinist, he sent me this video about ancient Egypt. And there was something in it that made the hairs on my head stand straight up. And I mean literally because there is an incredible divine revelation that's never been seen before and I'm gonna to try to lay it out the way that the Holy Spirit was showing me this morning and it's going to be a stunning revelation maybe for the world this is something that's astonishing and another incredible revelation like all the ones that I wrote about in my book, The Almond Tree, Aaron's Rod, The Messiah, King of Israel. They were all about Jesus and how the Lord was unveiling himself in the scriptures in a way that things that were never seen only could be revealed by the Holy Spirit and line up with the scriptures and every detail is laid out. It's a very large volume. It's actually something that should be um, you know, it's a scholarly book, so it should be enjoyed at all of the places like Oxford and Cambridge and all of these universities. And much to my amazement, it was acquired by Harvard University Library through a Judaica endowment of all things. And it's about the Jewish Jesus and the King of Glory. So there is something in my book that I talked about. Um, miraculously, the Lord opened all these doors and I was able to obtain the Shroud of Turin photographs from Dr. Petra Soons, who by the way read my book and gave me a five-star review and loved what I said about the image on the burial shroud and how it was formed and also um, the shroud photographer from the official stirp team Barry M. Schwartz and he and I were talking on the phone when I was living at my home and he 
put my book in his library in the year 2015, the year that it was published. So it's on the official Shroud of Turin webpage for the year 2015. You kind of have to look for it, and then you have to scroll down. Probably it's about halfway down that page, and you'll see my cover with the Ark of the Covenant on it with the almond tree that was the miracle that budded right there on Holy Mount Moriah where God's holy temple had been built twice. So I wrote all about the shroud. I wrote about the face cloth, the sudarium, and I was writing more about some of these things after that book ended. I started a new book that I have not been able to finish due to the death of mom and leaving our home and just having stuff in storage so it wasn't as easy to write and so I'm hoping at some time in the future God will open that door for me to be able to finish this incredible work for the Lord Jesus and he'll supply all my needs for the equipment I need and everything like that so incredibly this morning there was something regarding the image of the shroud of Jesus burial cloth that has the image of a crucified man on it and there was some knowledge I had from writing the book and the detailed research that I um, looked at Barry's information he's one of the foremost authorities on the shroud and he is Jewish and it took him 17 years or 18 years to acknowledge in his spirit that this was really Jesus on the burial cloth. Um, they actually did find blood, real blood, and there's so many other things. There's writings that are on there that, um, you know, tell who he is, basically. Uh, they found an amulet under the neck that uh, Petra Soons discovered, supposed to say the lamb um, in, I think it's three Hebrew letters. Um, there's a lot of detail to the Shroud of Turin. Most people just know from flippant little stories in the media and they cast it off as, oh, that can't be, you know, oh, it was dated to the Middle Ages. Well, that's because they took a piece of the shroud and dated that piece that was sewn on in the Middle Ages, and the Roman Catholic Church prevented any real detailed study of the shroud. Um, Barry told me, it seems like there's a, a tendency for the Catholic Church to try to not let it be examined and when when the Sturt team had they had seven days that they were allowed to do scientific study and research on it take pollen samples and they did all kinds of different types of photography you know um, spectrometry and a lot of different details now Petra Soons he's the one who took the shroud information from the photograph and they put it in this VP8 analyzer I believe it was called and it showed that the image had 3D information encoded in it. So one of the things that I was very familiar with is the stunning fact and most people don't know about this unless you've studied it but the shroud image itself is only on the surface of the linen and it did not bleed into you know the weave down under the threads and the image was put on after the blood so the blood stains are under the image now the thing about this is that the shroud fibers um, the image is on fibers of the linen burial shroud that are one-tenth the size of a human hair and 
some of the DVDs I have seen in the past about it said that you would have to have an atomic paintbrush to even be able to paint that onto these linen fibers at one-tenth the size of a human hair. Now that's an incredibly uh, nano measurement. It's very um, precise and accurate and it's an extreme precision I should say. Now there's something else when I was talking about the face cloth um, known as the sudarium and that you know the scriptures say that it was found folded in a place by itself and I had said these words in my book and I said that it was the word set aside for a higher purpose something that was in the sepulcher in the grave you know this is where you put a sarcophagus <laughs> um, in the situation with Jesus they laid him out so he was in the burial niche and I believe they added about I can't remember how much it was about seven or eight inches into the localus and dug that part out so it was longer and it has been said that the reason for that is because the person was taller than who it was intended for but personally I believe that because the feet were on the cross and they were bent downward that when he died his feet stayed kind of in that downward position so the addition to the localus to me spelled out that his feet were stayed in a kind of bent position to be able to fit in there like a little alcove and so that's the way I see it that it had to do with the way he was crucified and his feet you know being bent downward and then that would accommodate them whereas if he wasn't crucified his feet would have been upright like a dead person and they wouldn't need that extra space on the end of the sepulcher so to me that shows that the garden tomb has this added little space for the feet because he was crucified and they were stuck in that position now you're probably going to wonder why am I telling you all of that information right because I have something that's going to blow you away. The hairs on your head and your arms are going to stand up on end when you hear this. Because it is very exciting, thrilling, and profound. And only God could do this. So, my friend Glenn that sent me the video. The video had to do with ancient Egyptian machining because he's a machinist and he was I'm not sure that he's a believer but he's the one who caused me to find out that my book was at Harvard and today the video from Egypt talking about the things of Egypt had something in it that just raised the hair on my head and I put these two things together and it's extraordinary where it's leading so I want to share with you about the video and this video was called advanced ancient machining that is absurdly difficult to replicate even with modern technology and when he's talking about this machining from a machinist point of view he's talking about things that are so precision with measurements that they can not even figure out today how to replicate these intricate precision measurements that they performed back in the days of the ancient Egyptians and specifically so now I want you to listen very carefully to how they describe this ancient Egyptian machining 
And the description says, many ancient structures have been found with masonry that is simply mind-boggling. And what I'm about to show you is way mind-boggling. The ancient Egypt masons shaped all kinds of stone with intricate mastery. They were adept with the use of a wide variety of manufacturing tools various building stones, tube drills capable of hard material, straight cutting saws, circular cutting saws, lathes, and smoothing techniques for polishing. It is the marks left in the stone by these multitude of tools which are the reliable source of evidence of advanced machining in the ancient world. Modern experts are still puzzled by these construction techniques. How did they do it? So they could actually see circular saw marks on the granite of these sarcophagi that they said that they found and they were so precise in their cutting with their measurements that they are really baffled by how they did it. And they can see the uh, remains of the saw marks and how they put the blade in you know um, they said that one of them did not have a beginning blade mark where the blade starts cutting into the stone and they think that it, it was cut from the top of another stone down right on into the second stone so that was fascinating so I was about 16 minutes and 14 seconds into this video when I heard the words that are going to raise the hair on your head when I tell you. And the very words I used in my book, when he was talking about the sarcophagi, the very words I used in my book about finding the face cloth, I said it was set apart for a higher purpose. And I know what that purpose is. Um, it's something incredibly profound. So. Now, I want to share what the narrator said in this video, and he's talking about Egyptian, um, you know, how they carved all of the statues of pharaohs and, you know, many other jars. They could tell that they were turned on a lathe. They could tell, you know, that, you know, they had engraving tools that were precise and they had polishing methods to make the stone super smooth and to make the gap between the stones to where you can't even get a credit card in there because it's so straight and precise. This is the way the stones were in Jerusalem at the temple, mind you. They were perfection and this was something extremely precision machine done by a machinist. So I'm going to play the parts of the video that just raised the hair on my head when I made the reality of what this is really telling us and connecting it to the shroud and what I said about the face cloth of the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Lord God in the flesh that came to dwell in Jerusalem and all of the hills of Judea and all around Israel. And he tabernacled with his people, but his people, a lot of them did not recognize who he was. Some of them did, and they followed after him, and they were never sorry. So we will never be sorry we're following after him, because what he does is so incredible, so precise, so fascinating, that he wove this tapestry of in-depth scientific matter into his own testimony. So everything he created, physics and science, all of these, uh, you know, special parameters of 3D um, photography were on the shroud, on his burial shroud. But this one thing today that jumped out, I'm going to explain in the video what I heard and spell it out for you basically because this is an incredible revelation for the entire world and 
just wait till you hear this. Now this video has nothing to do with Jesus or the shroud or the face cloth or anything at all. There's no mention of it. This is all about Egypt and advanced ancient machining that is absurdly difficult to replicate even with modern technology and equipment. So I'm going to start this video at about 12 minutes and 6 seconds in and I'm going to play a clip and I'm going to end it, I believe it's around 1727 in the video. So from 1206 to 1727 and I want you to listen carefully to the words in this video talking about the ancient machinist capability that was in ancient Egypt. So here it goes. Listen very carefully. And is there an archaeological record in pre-dynastic and Old Kingdom Egypt pertaining to advanced ancient stone cutting techniques? Black basalt saw marks on the Giza Plateau and the King's Chamber. There are black basalt paving stones on the east side of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Most people walk over them, never realizing them, probably busy looking up at the Great Pyramid. These basalt pavers are irregular in thickness and often rounded on the bottom side. They were placed on top of blocks of limestone, which had previously been fitted to the underbelly bedrock. Amazingly, the basalt blocks were cut to level in situ after they'd been put in place on the ground. The edges are so crisp and parallel. The quality of this work indicates that the blade was held completely steady. Apparently, cutting basalt was not so slow and arduous that extra cuts like these would have been avoided as being an unnecessary waste of time. There are several places where overcuts like these can be seen. They show no trace of the wobbling cuts that might be expected of a long hand-pulled blade as it starts into hard material. That may be because these cuts were made as the blade was coming out of a cut above it and it was held firmly in place by the rock above it. We know that the stone box in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid was cut with a very large saw, one which was longer than the box, perhaps 10 feet. The marks on the bottom of the box were discovered and described by Flinders Petrie. He also described an error in cutting that went off the mark before the workers noticed to back out the saw from the cut and start over. These questions could perhaps be answered if microscopic examinations of the cut marks by contemporary specialists in manufacturing technology could analyze it. The works of William Flinders Petrie pioneered this research in the 1880s. Petrie in Egypt particularly, he showed there was an order or protocol for creating artifacts that involved the use of simple geometries. And such as simple radius, overall radii are combined to create a shape where one radius would lead to another radius that would then be tangent with a flat surface. And you find that at Giza near the pyramids and also other places around Egypt. There are so many remarkable artifacts that really have not received that much attention in conventional literature. And the simple methods that are described by Egyptologists don't really answer the question of how these artifacts were created. Because it's not just a matter of describing a tool and how you actually remove material from a block of granite, but also a range of instruments that would have been necessary to ensure that the measurements are consistent throughout the creation of those artifacts. The tools to measure are equally important as those used to cut, drill, and polish. Those tools don't exist in the archaeological record, nor have they been even suggested in the conventional literature that they did exist. So it's an open question right now, and it's certainly open for study by Egyptologists or universities who would care or dare to take up the challenge. And that challenge is to be able to come up with methods that would explain these artifacts in a way that modern engineers would understand and believe. Unfortunately, in the past, this has not taken place. We've not been directed or shown by people in Egyptology or in academia. We haven't been shown any methods that will adequately explain the creation of these artifacts. For example, perfectly flat surfaces that you find on the igneous rock or the granite and basalt diorite artifacts that occur all over Egypt. You'll find a very large block in the Valley Temple near the Sphinx at Giza. There's one wall where there is a diorite block that shows a high order of precision, 
being extremely flat. Comparative measurements using a very precise straight edge show precision to one-tenth the thickness of a human hair. Whilst this is extremely precise, you also find those kind of surfaces in the Great Pyramid and the granite box in the Great Pyramid, also the Second Pyramid. There are numerous very large, what they call sarcophagi, in the Serapium, and these sarcophagi are supposedly built to bury bulls. But the precision and the size of these boxes that seem to indicate a much higher purpose. One that would serve a technological purpose, rather than just for a funeral. Because on the inside of the boxes, you not only find very precise, flat surfaces, but also the corners where one surface meets another are extremely square. Also, the wall of the inside of the box where it meets the lid is extremely square. The fact that these artifacts and work materials exist has not been adequately explained in the literature we're trying to understand to really come to grips with. Egyptology isn't trying to come to grips with anything. Even how we will create these artifacts today, because it would really stretch our capabilities to make these artifacts, particularly the ones in the Serapeum. But these are fairly simple geometries. We go from the simple to the complex, and then it becomes a little more difficult to explain. Because not only a flat surface is fairly simple to understand in terms of how you would grind a surface flat now, when we move to more complex surfaces, we find that there are objects that have curved surfaces, or radii, and gathering the information about those, I've tried to determine how they were created. And gathering the information about those, I've tried to determine how they were created. But before you can actually do that, you have to determine exactly what it is that you're looking at. And that you can't do that without taking measurements. So taking measurements of those artifacts. When you have complex compound surfaces and compound radii that flow from one to the other, and also they seem to follow a general direction, or the contours are maybe cut, and then that contour flows along a straight line, and that straight line on an axis is very precise, to almost as though it would be made on a machine. And that, of course, is a very controversial suggestion. In today's world, you have to consider that because the Chu created any other way, it would be enormously difficult. And certainly for an artifact that's supposed to be part of a construction, it wouldn't require that much of that high precision if it was just for our construction purposes. If it was made by hand, it would take an enormous amount of time for you to create that precision, and it wouldn't be necessary anyway. Those are the kind of questions that need to be asked when we look at these artifacts. Listen to him again without looking at the video. Think about what he's saying. You'll find a very large block in the Valley Temple near the Sphinx at Giza. There's one wall where there is a diorite block that shows a high order of precision, being extremely flat. Comparative measurements using a very precise straight edge show precision to one-tenth the thickness of a human hair. Okay, so what he's saying is that there is a stone that's a straight-cut stone. I believe that he's talking about a stone. He said that there's a log book that was found and I know from researching further that there is a logbook that they found dating back 4,000 to 4,500 years, which I'll get to in a minute. But it told how they built the pyramids by the operator that was doing the work with his team. and. What he's saying is that this precise measurement was found in this log book at the Sphinx and the measurement making a straight precise line the way that they calculated it is so precise that it is one-tenth the size of a human hair. When I heard that I had the hair stand up I was thinking back about the Shroud of Turin and how the image is only on the surface and it's on fibers that are one-tenth the size of a human hair. 
When do you ever hear that? Or that phrase? Or that measurement? Now, one more thing. There's one wall where there is a diorite block that shows a high order of precision, being extremely flat. Comparative measurements using a very precise straight edge show precision to one-tenth the thickness of a human hair. Whilst this is extremely precise, you also find those kind of surfaces in the Great Pyramid and the granite box in the Great Pyramid, also the Second Pyramid. There are numerous very large, what they call sarcophagi, in the Serapium. And these sarcophagi are supposedly built to bury bulls. But the precision and the size of these boxes that seem to indicate a much higher purpose. So, I was talking about Jesus' sepulcher in my book. Talking about the face cloth being set apart for a higher purpose. And here he's talking in Egypt where he's showing the precision cuts of the sarcophagi, which are the place of the sepulchers, and saying that same phrase that I said, that this was set apart as a higher purpose, or for a higher purpose. But right now I'm showing this incredible revelation to tell you this. So the experts do say about the Shroud of Turin. Kevin Moran, an optical engineer, says the Shroud image is made from tiny fibers that are one-tenth the size of a human hair. And this is the measurement they found in ancient Egypt at the pyramids at the Sphinx. So what we're talking about here is some sort of extraordinarily difficult, almost impossible, mind-boggling measurement, one-tenth the size of a human hair. So I did research to find out what is the width of a human hair and what is a tenth of it. So I looked up to find out if I could figure out the size of a human hair in width and it turns out to be that a human hair is 0 0.035 millimeters and one-tenth of that 0 0.035 calculates to 28571 dot 428571 four two nine percent of zero point zero three five if you find out the size of a human hair and you find out one tenth of it you come up right here with this number one tenth and this is the size of a human hair zero point zero three five a tenth of that is this number right here, 28571.428571429% of 0 0.35. And that measurement is the same size as the image fibers that are just on the surface of the Shroud of Turin they are one-tenth the size of a human hair.
So this is mind-blowing that the precision measurement is not only in the sarcophagi and other artifacts of Egypt, but mainly also at the pyramids, the Giza pyramid, in some of the other pyramids in the Valley of the Kings. That precise measurement is found and now I'm connecting it that it's found on the image of Jesus on his burial shroud. And this incredible fact alone can prove to a precision measurement that that is Jesus on the burial cloth. I don't know if anybody else would have ever caught that statement about the ancient Egyptian machining or machinist work and that measurement. But because I had written about the shroud image and it being one-tenth the size of a human hair that the image is actually on those small of fibers where the image is all on the shroud, meaning that the fibers that the images are on are one-tenth of the size of a human hair are odds beyond our understanding. I'm also blown away that he used the same words to say that the sarcophagi were so precise that they were almost like for a higher purpose. The exact words I used to speak about the sidarium, the face cloth, left set apart by itself in Jesus' sepulcher. I know I'm repeating myself in some of this, but I'm very excited the narrator made the comment that they were trying to figure out how, if the Egyptians only had primitive tools, how could they have carved the granite so smoothly, and they really actually showed that they used ancient machining tools like lathes and saws. And of course, I wrote to tell Penny Caldwell and Jim Caldwell uh, they'd been to the real Mount Sinai in Arabia and discovered the split rock of Horeb. And I wrote to Penny to tell her these things because I was so excited. And basically I said, I'm telling you that it was about 5.30 a.m. when this came together. And I had the hairs on my arms standing upright. Because what came to my mind is Jesus' flight to Egypt. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. And this precise measurement of one-tenth the size of a human hair being found at the Sphinx and the pyramids in ancient Egypt and on their artwork and being on the burial shroud of Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, is something only God could do because one-tenth the size of a human hair is that number that I just gave you. And it is like a nano measurement. It's like an atomic measurement that no human can produce. Now in Hosea 11, 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So now, he talked about a log book being found by the Sphinx. There is something called the Dream Stella, but it talks about, you know, dedicating these various things to these gods and all. But there were recently in July 18th of 2016 an ancient log book documenting the Great Pyramid's construction was unveiled. A log book that contains records detailing the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza has been put on public display at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The Great Pyramid of Giza was built in honor of the Pharaoh Khufu reign circa 2551 BC to 2528 BC. 
and is the largest of the three pyramids constructed on the Giza Plateau in Egypt. Considered a wonder of the world by ancient writers, the Great Pyramid was 481 feet tall when it was first constructed. Today it stands at 455 feet. The log book was written in hieroglyphic letters on pieces of papyri, and its author was an inspector named Merer, who was in charge of a team of about 200 men. Archaeologists Pierre Tallet and Gregory Marard wrote in an article published in 2014 in the journal Near Eastern Archaeology. Tallet and Marard are leaders of an archaeological team from France and Egypt that discovered the logbook at the Red Sea harbor of Wadi El Jarfin in 2013. Talit and Marard are leaders of an archaeological team from France and Egypt that discovered the logbook at the Red Sea harbor of Wadi El Jarfin, 2013, and it dates back about 4,500 years, making it the oldest papyrus document ever discovered in Egypt. Over a period of several months, the logbook reports in the form of a timetable with two columns per page many operations related to the construction of the Great Pyramid of Khufu at Giza and the work at the limestone quarries on the opposite bank of the Nile, they wrote. And Mera recorded the logs in the 27th year of Khufu's reign. His records say that the Great Pyramid was near completion, with much of the remaining work focusing on the construction of the limestone casing that covered the outside of the pyramid. The limestone used in this casing, according to the logbook, was quarried at Tura near modern-day Cairo and was brought to the pyramid site by boat along the Nile River and a system of canals. One boat trip between Tura and the pyramid site took four days to complete the logbook notes. The logbook also says that in Khufu's 27th year, the construction of the Great Pyramid was being overseen by the vizier Ankhof, also spelled Ankhof, the half-brother of Khufu. The vizier was a high-ranking official in ancient Egypt who served the king. Actually, Joseph was a vizier. The papyri also revealed that one of the titles Ankhof held was chief for all the works of the king. And that's what they wrote in their journal article. Though the logbook said Ankhof was in charge during the pharaoh's 27th year, many scholars believe it's possible that another person, possibly the vizier, Hemenunu was in charge of the pyramid building during the earlier part of Khufu's reign. In the press release, museum representatives did not specify how long the logbook will be on public display. So that was a while ago in 2016. Now there were several papyri found or papyruses found, um, other logbooks. There's one called the Papyrus Jarf C, building a double Jada in the central delta. Papyrus Jarfdi work for the residence and the valley temple of Khufu. Another papyri, other log books E and F and associated accounts G to L and other fragments are much more fragmentary and their contents have yet to be deciphered and or published. So from one of these log books they basically found this measurement of one-tenth the size of a human hair, a precision straight line that was used, and that measurement is on Jesus' burial shroud. Out of Egypt I called my son. And so the Shroud of Turin, through this measurement, can be proven to be the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah, who came out of Egypt and came into the land of Israel, which it says twice. And this was the logbook called the Diary of Merer, M-E-R-E-R, -E -R, 
also known as Papyrus Jarf, is the name for papyrus logbooks written over 4,500 years ago by Murrer, a middle-ranking official with the title Inspector. They are the oldest known papyri with text dating to the 27th year of the reign of Pharaoh Khufu during the 4th dynasty. The text written with hieratic hieroglyphs mostly consists of lists of the daily activities of Murr and his crew. The best preserved sections, papyrus jarf A and B, document the transportation of white limestone blocks from Tura quarries to Giza by boat. Buried in front of man-made caves that served to store the boats at Wadi Al Jarf on the Red Sea coast, the papyri were found and excavated in 2013 by a French mission under the direction of the archaeologist Pierre Tallet of Paris, Sorbonne University, and Gregory Marard. The Egyptian archaeologist Zahi Hawass describes the diary of Merer as the greatest discovery in Egypt in the 21st century. Parts of the papyri are exhibited at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The most intact papyri describes several months of work with the transportation of limestone from quarries Tura North and Tura South to Giza in the 27th year of the reign of Pharaoh Khufu. Though the diary does not specify where the stones were to be used or for what purpose, given the diary may date to what is widely considered to be the very end of Khufu's reign, Talit believes that they were most likely for cladding the outside of the Great Pyramid. About every ten days, two or three round trips were done, shipping perhaps 30 blocks of two to three tons each, amounting to 200 blocks per month. About 40 boatmen worked under him. The period covered in the papyri extends from July to November. The entries in the logbooks are all arranged along the same line. At the top, there's a heading naming the month and the season. Under that, there's a horizontal line listing the days of the months. Under the entries for the days, there are always two vertical columns describing what happened on these days. Section B, Day 1, the director of 6 Ijiru casts for Heliopolis in a transport boat to bring us food from Heliopolis while the elite is in Tura. Day 2, Inspector Murr spends the day with his troop hauling stones in Tura North, spending the night in Tura North. The diary also mentions the original name of the Great Pyramid, Akhet Khufu, meaning Horizon of Khufu. In addition to Merer, a few other people are mentioned in the fragments. The most important is Ankoff, half-brother of Pharaoh Khufu, known from other sources, who's believed to have been a prince and vizier under Khufu and or Khafra. In the papyri, he is called a nobleman, a tri um, iripat, an overseer of Rashi Khufu. The later place was the harbor at Giza where Talit believes the casing stones were transported. And for Jesus' image to be on one-tenth the size of a human hair, on fibers that small, being a measurement in Egypt where he came out of, shows the mighty power of God. Let this soak in. For now, that's all for tonight. I hope this blessed you. Shalom for now.